So thank you very much, everybody, for joining uh, this talk. Uh, I look forward to um, your questions uh, at the end. And uh, or please feel free to interrupt me if you want. So as I mentioned, uh, the work that I have uh, that I will talk about is in collaboration with Arzucan Özgür, a, a, uh, a professor of computer science at Boğaziçi University. And uh, there are also some uh, um, people in the audience that have uh, contributed, such as Yi, whose work uh, I will talk about for class imbalance uh, question. And then Riza and Bak have also joined for the uh, biochemical uh, language processing part of the talk. Thank you very much uh, to them also for agreeing to join today. Okay, so let's look at the different types of text data in the biomedical domain. Um, in the uh, biomedical domain has a very uh, domain specific language, right? So the, for example, the papers that we read uh, that are related to biology or biomedicine uh, have a very domain specific language. Even though they are natural languages, obviously, uh, they, uh, they have a lot of terminology and also some, let's say lingo, right? Uh, that makes them specific. DNA sequence, protein sequence, chemical formulae can also be expressed in string-based representations. So they are also, uh, can be considered text data in the biomedical domain. And again, the challenge is that they are very context and also domain specific uh, and therefore hard to process. But that's not the only thing that's hard about them to make them uh, amenable to processing by computers. There's also the challenge that a lot of data in the biomedical domain is um, actually limited in terms of sampling all of uh, sample space. For example, for protein compound interactions, some protein compounds are uh, heavily studied while some protein compound interactions are not uh, so well studied because they're either hard to study or they're, maybe they're not prioritized. Um, so making this uh, sampling of, of all of knowledge space about protein compounds or even uh, well, yes, proteins and chemicals um, limited. Likewise, when you look at, for example, the uh, text data in uh, biomedical domain in terms of scientific literature, not all of the sentences contain, let's say you're looking for relations between a protein and a compound, right? Within a certain text, this can be a paper. Not all of the sentences are going to be linked to that protein compound interaction. So finding the information, the relevant information becomes a needle in a haystack problem uh, because the, the, the sampling space is very large. And in fact, the, uh, the, uh, or the space is very large, but the sampling is not uh, performed all over that space. So this uh, figure comes from actually uh, Arthur, who kindly uh, shared this with me. And this is from a paper that was recently, just on Friday, accepted for publication uh, in patterns uh, called Labels in a Haystack Approaches Beyond Supervised Learning in Biomedical Applications. And you see, I mean, I don't need to remind this audience that, uh, so this, uh, pay, uh, this figure is about the va value of data. You will see that, for example, if uh, the green and the uh, magenta uh, circles are your data points, if you collected data like the like in panel B, you would have multiple models that would fit uh, that data data. But whereas the uh, if you were able to collect data points like in panel C, this would be more valuable in uh, pinning that correct model, right? So different data points have different values. This is the main message of this paper, basically. And when you when you have when you encounter this needles in a haystack problem, you can in fact use several methodologies. Again, this is from uh, the paper that was recently accepted. Uh, you can use several different methodologies to address this, such as semi-supervision, active learning, 
data augmentation, transfer learning, which is obviously taking uh, uh, over the whole, um, uh, the whole field, self-supervision or weak supervision. So these are some of the methodologies that are being used beyond uh, supervised learning. And uh, one thing that one sh we should also mention is that labeling of data is very expensive in biomedical domain uh, because it requires domain expertise. And also, um, it's not easy, it's not sometimes so straightforward to label, and there can be even disagreement between experts in labeling that data. So uh, finding labeled data for supervised learning becomes also a problem. Uh, this is why this is another reason why we need ne this needles in a haystack type approaches. So today I'd like to talk to you about uh, four of our recent. Um, publications where uh, on the left hand side we focus on natural text, meaning uh, scientific uh, language, let's say, uh, scientific English in this case, uh, where we uh, built a search engine to find related protein compound pairs in COVID 19 literature. And then uh, we look at some balancing methods for multi label text classification with long tailed class distribution. And on the right hand side, I, I will uh, talk about protein compound interactions and how we developed some of these string based approaches. But then we have to take one more step to make sure that we are also addressing this bias in the data in um, protein compound uh, interaction prediction. Okay, let's jump right in. So this is. Uh, Vapur, which is a search engine to find related protein compound pairs in COVID-19 literature. Vapur means ship in uh, Turkish. So the idea is that it's searching, it's uh, uh, crawling through space, that space uh, of protein compound space, right? And the motivation was that, I mean, everybody knows that COVID-19 uh, sort of exploded the uh, knowledge space of publications. And it was very difficult to find relevant information from these publications. This is, I, to be honest, I don't know, even know when this was from, but this is probably from last year when the paper was published. So you can imagine that the, the number of publications have, has increased exponentially. So we have built this uh, user interface where the user can uh, search for uh, either a protein or a compound to find uh, the protein compound pairs from the currently available COVID-19 literature. The system components uh, is as follows. It's an online search engine specifically designed to find related protein chemical pairs and it is empowered by a, a relation oriented inverted index in order to group studies relevant to a biomolecule. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, with respect to its related entities. And this online interface is designed to, for the smooth traversal, <laughs> as a ship would do, of current literature by researchers and it's publicly available. So it starts with CORD19. This is the data set that is being curated um, continuously. Uh, retrieve the free text abstracts, use Genia, and then uh, do tokenization, use Burn to get uh, uh, normalized entities, and then relation indexing followed by when the search query is entered, uh, followed by the um, identification of relevant publications. Oops, sorry. One second. Okay. Um, can you still hear me? Because I yes, can't... yes, 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 okay, definitely. Great. Um, so CORD19, as I mentioned, is a regularly updated data set. And when you look at the statistics of this CORD19 snapshot from last year, right? So there are 200,000 documents. But you see that there are only 18,000 relations and, in fact, uh, 20,000 unique chemicals, 70,000 unique proteins. This was the needle in a haystack problem that I was just mentioning, right? So um, 
this is why it's very hard to very hard for uh, this information retrieval or, or extraction. When we do when we did error analysis of uh, the tool, we saw that um, the entities that were incorrectly labeled or incorrect uh, relations that were incorrectly labeled were in fact uh, the ones that uh, showed error, suggesting that the methodology is in fact robust. So um, when we, uh, as I mentioned, when, when you look at the, uh, all of that space, you also see that some proteins or some compounds or some entities are highly um, repeated, right? Because they're highly prioritized. Uh, lots of labs are working on them, whereas some of the other compounds or proteins are not so well studied and there's a, an imbalance. Uh, so this is prevalent in all of literature, uh, in all of uh, biomedical domain, actually. So in order to address this, we looked at some balancing methods for multi-label text classification uh, with long-tailed class distribution. And he will present this paper in EMNLP in two or three weeks, I think, right? November 9th. So um, we used two data sets to um, uh, study this problem, the long tail distribution, this class imbalance problem. One is the Reuters data set, and the other one is the PubMed data set. So Reuters is a very commonly used data set. This is why we used it. It's a, sort of a benchmark data set. And let me uh, show you uh, what we mean by long tail distribution and co-occurrence. So when you look at this uh, sort of graph, of number of articles against sorted label index, you will see that some um, in the indices or some labels have thousands of articles associated with them, whereas some labels have uh, maybe one or two uh, articles associated with them, right? So th there is a skewness in this uh, distribution. And in fact, some of the, when you look at these labels, some of the labels co-occur with each other. So you will see on the left-hand side, for example, nickel. So there are two uh, sentences, two titles, Penn Central Cells UK unit, US Mint seeking offers on copper nickel. You will see nickel uh, co-occurring with acquires a strategic metal. Uh, so this is these are the labels, right? Um, and with copper. So even though nickel is a rare um, label, the labels that it co-occurs with uh, are common labels, for example, 1650, 1650 times or 16 times or 47 times. So what is uh, the machine learning uh, going to do? It's going to assign strategic metal or ACQ uh, to, the, um, to the text uh, to increase its probability of winning, let's say. Uh, rather than assigning nickel. So nickel won't, won't find um, a label. Uh, the other data set that we used again was PubMed. And this PubMed data set actually comes from the BioASQ challenge, which we participated in and was really successful actually, uh, providing PubMed articles with titles and abstracts that have been manually labeled for mesh. And the similar, a similar case, uh, is observed here where the number of articles versus sort of label index is very uh, imbalanced. And there are several labels that co occur with each other. So, loss function manipulation is a commonly used method that can address class imbalance. And, uh, but binary cross entropy, which is a commonly used method, is vulnerable to label imbalance due to dominance of head classes or negative instances. So head classes would be highly occurring classes, right? And resampling and reweighting are, are not effective when there's label dependency um, because they result in oversampling of common labels, which is what I was talking about. So it, it, the uh, ACQ label is going to be um, uh, assigned uh, because it's going to be oversampled. 
Multi-label classification has in fact been widely used in computer vision domain and has recently benefited from cost sensitive learning through loss functions in uh, different domains of uh, computer vision. And it's, it has also been explored in natural language processing because it works in a model architecture agnostic fashion by explicitly embedding the solution into the objective. So we decided to um, borrow these ideas from computer vision and also uh, NLP and develop new loss functions and apply them to NLP. And we propose using distribution balanced loss with three layers, a focal loss layer, rebalanced weighting and negative tolerant retolerization, regularization, sorry. Focal loss, this is again, another common uh, loss function, right? Places a higher weight of loss on hard to classify instances predicted with low probability on the ground truth, while negative tolerant regularization addresses the co-occurrence problem. DB loss or dis distribution balance loss first reduces re redundant inf information of label co-occurrence and then explicitly assigns lower weight on easy to classify negative instances. And then uh, negative tolerant regularization helps to avoid oversuppression of negative labels caused by dominance of negative classes in binary cross entropy. So we use micro F1 and macro F1 as metrics to measure our, let's say, success or performance. And this is a sort of a summary of table of our results to show that DB loss, this distribution balance loss, improves classification performance even for tail labels. Let me walk you through this uh, table. So this is total, head labels, medium labels, tail labels. So total is total performance, right? Head labels is performance for the head labels that uh, for PubMed, uh, it is defined as labels that occur more than 50 times. Medium labels are labels that occur between 15 and 50 times. And then tail labels occur only uh, below 15. Uh, SVM, this is a, a, let's say a baseline method and BC, binary cross entropy, also a baseline method. You see when, when you compare head versus tail performance, SVM performance drops considerably. And in fact, BCE uh, doesn't even uh, perform at all for the medium and tail labels. But distribution balance loss, not only does the total uh, performance increase, but also the tail performance is significantly increased uh, compared to the, the baseline. So if we dig a little bit deeper, so this was for the um, PubMed data set. So I will try to slowly, let's say, emerge <laughs> uh, for, uh, to show you the uh, full table. So on the left-hand side are the uh, Reuters results. On the right-hand side are the PubMed results. And these are the different loss functions that we used. So this is basically the same slide, except uh, now I have micro and macro F1 scores outlined. You see that DB performs uh, much better compared to SVM and BCE, even for tail labels. When we compare DB with uh, the other uh, uh, loss functions that are commonly used, such as focal loss, class balance focal loss, rebalance focal loss, or negative tolerant regularization focal loss, we see that DB performs or outperforms them as well. And uh, for the Reuters data set, in fact, we also compared, uh, because it's a benchmark data set, we were also able to compare uh, with other methodologies that showed that the micro F1 score was less than 90, uh, which was very satisfying for us because uh, the uh, micro F1 score that we achieved was uh, more than 90. Uh, for PubMed, there is no, uh, there's no, um, for that data set, there's no comparison. Right. So we also did an ablation study to understand the impact of having uh, rebalancing, have a, having negative tolerant regularization, or having focal loss. And in all cases, it was clear that 
both or sorry, all, all of the three layers were necessary for high performance of DB. And we also introduced another uh, a novel loss function, class balanced uh, loss function um, with CB plus NTR plus focal loss. So the three layers. And again, CB and NTR, sorry, uh, were either number one or number two in all cases, showing that these three layers were really significantly improving uh, tail performance. The most common errors were due to incorrect classification to similar or linked labels for all loss functions. And you see, for example, for Reuters, the most common three pairs of classes confused by all loss functions were uh, platinum and gold, yen and money FX, platinum and copper. So uh, you can imagine that um, uh, the um, concurrence was, a, um, was an issue, was still an issue here. Okay, let's uh, briefly switch gears now to uh, talk about this, um, uh, we were always, we were talking about scientific literature and finding information in scientific literature. Now let's switch gears a little bit to talk about protein compound binding affinity prediction. I mentioned to you that proteins and compounds and even DNA can be expressed in string based representations. And uh, we are going to be using this uh, string based representation to um, make predictions about binding affinity. This paper was recently published uh, and resides in the audience. And so is Arzajan, of course. Uh, uh, Hakime is right now in the Cancer Center in Heidelberg. Uh, I don't need to talk about the motivation for uh, accelerating drug discovery. Drug discovery is a very expensive process and we would love to accelerate this uh, from uh, three to six years uh, to faster and to assist this, uh, computational methodologies are finding, I mean, have been finding uh, um, interest for the past, I don't know, 30 years, <laughs> more than 30 years, probably. Okay, so what is protein compound inter interaction prediction? A protein and a ligand are, they actually bind to each other uh, using uh, 3D, uh, three dimensional complementarity, right? So there's a, um, binding site and the ligand recognizes and binds to that binding site. Now you can imagine that the ligand has a certain shape, but the active site also needs to have a certain shape. And in fact, when you look at the active sites uh, as a functional you know, units, um, classification based on active site uh, is actually very informative for function as well. At the end of the day, the function of the protein is to bind to something else, usually. Uh, therefore, we said, okay, the, this uh, binding interaction is actually informative for um, understanding how uh, a protein and compound binds to each other. Nothing revolutionary, right? But it's like saying, tell me who your friend is and I will tell you who you are. So uh, I will use this information in a minute now. So, um, I, but I mentioned to you that even though I'm talking about 3D shape now, uh, I mentioned to you that uh, the, uh, both the protein and the ligand can be expressed in terms of uh, a string-based representation. And here we use, in this work, uh, we use the SMILES representation, uh, which uses parentheses for branching. So, um, it's not, uh, it basically um, takes the 2D representation and uh, projects it to a 1D space. But what are the words? If these mild representations of these compounds is a document, what are the words? A simple and let's say naive way to uh, find the words in a document that is not, uh, that doesn't have any gaps, right? Is to just divide it into chunks. So this is, uh, the methodology is called lingo. Here, I'm just showing you for this compound, uh, these three words that make up that SMILES representation, right? And um, now that I have the words, I can use 
for example, distributed word representations, word to vec, uh, to uh, project those words onto a vector space. And this is um, maybe you've heard of this, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. Uh, this is based on um, these analogy games that we played in uh, high school or middle school. King is to queen as, sorry, as man is to woman, right? Um, by Mikolo. Similarly, the similar with the similar idea, taking the smiles corpus from PubChem, learning a uh, neural networks based learning with skip gram and uh, 100 uh, dimensional real valued embeddings, we can project these words onto chemical word vectors. And this paper was actually published in 2018 that we call smiles vec. And what we now need to do now that we have projected those words onto the space, right, using this learning methodology, I, I now have the, these individual words. You can imagine thousands and thousands of these words projected onto the space. Now I can pick the, the, the vectors that correspond to these words to come up with the smiles vec of my compound. That's the whole idea. So the resultant vector is basically the uh, compound vector for the chemical words. Now, do you remember that I told you that I will re be representing the protein by the compounds uh, that it binds to? Because I will be saying, tell me who your friends are and I will build your picture <laughs> kind of thing. So uh, the protein in this case is silylidase, the interacting ligands are Dan and Saya that have these two chemical smiles vectors that I obtained using the methodology that I just described. And the silylidase vector then just becomes this uh, result vector for the, uh, of the two interacting ligands. And um, so with this um, idea or with these ideas, we came up with this ChemBoost uh, um, methodology or approach where the smiles, uh, the chemical words, uh, and the smiles vec results in a ligand representation for each ligand. And then the amino acid uh, is, amino acid sequence, sorry, is used to either use smith waterman vectors or protvec vectors or the ligand-centric vector approach that I just described. So smith waterman and protvec are, uh, have been published previously by other researchers. Ligand-centric is our approach. And the ligand-centric approach, you can use the high affinity ligands or all of the known ligands or other external resources. And then you use vector conc concatenation to come up with a protein representation. And combining all of this with XGBoost, hence the name ChemBoost, you come up with an affinity score. And ChemBoost achieves high performance in comparison to benchmark and to state of the art uh, at the time that uh, it was published. Well, state of the art, as it turns out, was deep DTA at the time, which is also a paper that we had published. And deep DTA is basically just using raw, raw protein and compound sequences uh, or you know, string representations uh, without extracting, without uh, uh, let's say, uh, extracting vectors, it's just using convolutional neural networks to come up with this really successful scores. We tested our results on two data sets, binding DB and Kiva. Binding DB is a more general protein, data, protein compound data set, whereas Kiva is a kinase data set. But there's a catch. So, yeah, all wonderful, right? MSC of 0.4 uh, or 0.2, great. But predictions for novel biomolecules is still a challenge. I told you that we are not able to sample all of biomolecule space when we study protein compound interactions or when we do experiments, because some proteins are easier to work with, some compounds are easier to work with. And uh, there are, anyway, drug discovery campaigns, right? So you uh, build a bunch of compound libraries. So some of the biomolecules are highly sampled, 
whereas some of them are not so highly sampled. So not all of space is sampled and predictions for novel biomolecules still remains a challenge. So generalization to out of distribution well, that's a challenge for all of computer science, I guess. So let me give you a few definitions. When I say cold ligand, it means that the ligand was not encountered before. Whereas when I say cold protein, it means that the protein was not encountered before in the training set. Now, rem rem reminder that the protein or the compound may be encountered, but the 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 training is uh, that uh, the relation is not encountered, right? So this is, that's the sort of secret information that you're trying to predict. So the cold protein is when the protein is encountered for the first time. The cold ligand is when the ligand is encountered for the first time, but there may also be cases where the protein and the ligand are cold. And when we look at different models or different um, uh, methodologies, we see that when, the, when we look at warm performance, the mean square error is around 0.3. But as soon as you uh, encounter a cold ligand or a cold protein or a cold protein and ligand pair, the mean square error drops to around one, which is quite high compared to the warm case. So predictions for novel biomolecules is still a challenge. Therefore, we try to address this problem by using model debiasing to boost uh, drug target affinity prediction. This paper was recently submitted. Reza is in the, uh, in the audience. I saw back in the audience and Arzujan is in the audience. So uh, they are all here. The idea is that based, is based on if data set biases are outstanding, then weak learners can learn these patterns. And then you use these patterns to build something called an inverted bias coefficient. So you say, you've learned these, the weak learner, you've learned this pattern. Well, that's a surface pattern. Let's invert that and uh, try to suppress it, right? And the inverted bias coefficient is higher for more informative samples. After you uh, go through the weak learner, in this case, we sample, we tested, let's say, uh, two different or four different uh, weak learners. We then feed this information to the strong learner to guide strong learner training. And we saw that this is the gain, so the uh, increase in uh, performance due to debiasing. We saw that debiasing improves prediction performance for both warm and cold ligand, cold protein, and cold both cases. So in summary, I tried to talk about some of the work that we have been doing, uh, both in scientific literature search, but also in protein compound affinity prediction. And to summarize, um, we proposed uh, and compared the application of a series of balancing loss functions to address the class imbalance problem in multi-label text classification. We introduced this uh, loss function called distribution balance loss to NLP, and we also designed a novel loss function, class balanced NTR, uh, and introduced that and test that in NLP. And we saw that DB outperforms other approaches and its performance is robust to different data sets, such as Reuters, which, is, which has 90 labels in its general domain, and PubMed, which has 18,000 labels, so a huge number of labels, and biomedical domain. Then I talked about model debiasing for protein compound affinity prediction, where we proposed a debiased DTA. So using a model debiasing approach to boost drug target affinity prediction performance. And we saw that this debiasing improved the performance of both known and novel biomolecules. And uh, it boosted prediction, uh, the affinity prediction models of different architectures. So I would like to acknowledge, uh, I mean, I, uh, it was a hard job trying to fit uh, everybody, but I, then decided I will only mention the names that were working on these four papers. 
So of course, uh, I need to thank all of the data science and mass analytics section members, which includes Artur, uh, and past and present members of the Özkınlı and Özgür Labs. And uh, so the Boğaziçi team and the Roche team, uh, we have been working together um, for the past a year and a half now uh, for these four papers that I talked to you about. And I would like to thank you very much for listening to me. Thanks.